Good evening, everyone. I'm Alekia Malena, primary DMV. Today's case conference is on pubes endothelial corneal dystrophy, and moderator for today's class is Dr. Nivedita Narayanan. The pubes coming to pubes endothelial corneal dystrophy. Can anyone define what is pubes endothelial corneal dystrophy? And pubes uh, endothelial uh, corneal dystrophy is uh, one of the endothelial uh, hereditary. Uh, dystrophies in which the endothelium corneal endothelial count is less than normal by age which uh, decreases as com as more rapidly as compared to a normal yeah but what is what is endothelial cell loss exaggerated is what you're saying but what is the specific pathonomic presence, presence of, of yeah pre yeah which uh, during the, uh, due to those uh, decreased endothelial cells uh, and the uh, pumping action affected uh, there is uh, this endothelial cells try to accommodate between themselves uh, causing polymegathism and uh, eventually leading to uh, gutte formation okay sort of right go ahead with the presentation yes, it's a bilateral progressive non inflammatory disease of corneal endothelium characterized by accelerated loss of corneal endothelial cells and formation of posterior excrescences called gutte in this left picture, we can see uh, thickening of DM and excrescences called gutte. And this is a histopathological section of one of our, our fugue patients who underwent DMA, uh, showing gutte and a loss of endothelial cells. Coming to epidemiology and genetics, it shows autosomal dominant inheritance. Based on the age of onset, it is divided into early onset and late onset type. Early onset type is a rare type which occurs, which manifests in first decade of life. Here, males and females are commonly affected, and the most common gene involved is collagen 8 alpha 2. In late onset, is the most common variant. This manifests in during fourth and fifth decade of life. Here, females are most commonly affected. The most common genes involved are transcription factor 4, 8, AGBL1 gene, LOX ST1 gene, SLC4A11, and transforming growth factor beta induced protein. Affected parent is the only risk factor for this disease. And Fuchs is associated with many systemic and ocular diseases like cardiovascular diseases, myodonic dystrophy, axial hypermetropia, shallow anterior chamber, etc. Before going to pathology, just see the normal physiology of endothelium. Endothelium is a monolayer of uniformly organized hexagonal cells whose main function is to regulate corneal detergents, thus maintaining corneal clarity. So, what is corneal detergents? Yeah, next person who is willing to answer now? Yeah, yes, um, um, corneal uh, detergents is the process by which the endothelial pump uh, so as to maintain the hydration is maintained so the hydration level of the cornea is maintained uh, okay so why is it important because uh, so as to maintain the transparency of the cornea ma'am the water okay. level should be uh, maintained fine go ahead uh, alekia corneal detergents is the related dehydrated state of cornea and it is maintained by balance between water imbibing and water pumping of factors Water imbibing factors are stromal swelling pressure and intraocular pressure, and water pumping of factors are endothelial pump and endothelial barrier itself. So, what is stromal pressure and what is imbibition pressure? And swelling pressure is due to the negative charge of glycosaminoglycans, which is there in the stroma. Correct. Okay. And patient pressure is the difference between the IOP and the stromal swelling pressure. Swelling pressure when it is higher. It increases, it thickens the cornea or it thins the cornea? It will thicken the cornea. Okay. Uh, I like your, go ahead, ma. Yes, sir. So, as said, uh, imbibition pressure is IOP minus stromal pressure. When IOP exceeds stromal pressure, corneal edema occurs. This can happen when IOP is more, as in glaucoma, or uh, when stromal pressure is less, as in case of dystrophy. So coming to pathophysiology, can anyone say the basic pathophysiology of fuchs dystrophy? Yeah, quickly, uh, somebody offered to answer the question. Basic pathophysiology. And due to decreased uh, mm -hmm. corneal endothelial cells, uh, which on further, uh, uh, due to any other uh, intervened uh, procedure like uh, surgical procedures like uh, phaco emulsification or surgery, trabeculectomy, or further, uh, like uh, where the corneal endothelium is further, the loss is further uh, increased. So that uh, affects the endothelial pump, uh, which thereby leads to corneal edema. They, uh, and as I told previously, the, there's corneal, uh, there's polymegathism and corneal gutte, 
and on uh, microscopy they lead to uh, like a uh, beaten metal like appearance or anvil shaped okay uh, i think uh, dr sarod you have a little confusion in uh, differentiating between fuchs and the other forms of corneal decomposition whenever the endothelium does not Sorry. function okay whenever the endothelium does not function the cornea swells so which is what you have just explained in a situation where there is an exaggerated endothelial cell loss you will have corneal swelling but there is something specific for fuchs why should there be a loss okay in fuchs dr alekia will tell us now go ahead ma'am and that is by the disease itself the endothelial cell uh, up, there's apoptosis and uh, increased uh, because of the genetic Okay. Okay. Very good attempt. Just wait for Lekia to explain you. It will be more clear. Fuchs dystrophy is a multifactorial disease. Exogenous factors like UV exposure and smoking, and endogenous factors like gene mutations cause oxidative stress. This damages mitochondrial DNA and ultimately leads to apoptosis of endothelial cells, thereby decreasing pump density also. And endothelial to mesenchymal transition occurs. because of which there is aberrant uh, secretion of endo uh, extracellular matrix components like collagen and fibronectin just stop stop here so did you understand dr saurabh that because of the so many factors there is a basic problem and an extra membrane yes. is being produced so that is the key in pathogenesis in fuchs compared to the rest of the thing okay did you understand thank you ma'am yeah go ahead Uh, these extracellular matrix components gets deposited on dm resulting in gutte and dm thickening and endothelial cells over this gutte secrete a dilute cytoplasm and uh, rosette nucleus and there will be endothelial dysfunction loss of tight junctions will be there leading to leaky barrier and pump dysfunction ultimately it is because of accelerated cell loss and pump failure because of accelerated cell loss there will occur gap and endo uh, surrounding endothelial cells migrate to fill in the gaps leading to polymegathism and pleomorphism and pump failure and leaky barrier because of this fluid gets collected in stroma leading to stromal edema when the disease further advances there will be corneal epithelial edema which is microcystic in the beginning later the microcyst coalesces to form bulle and when bulle ruptures corneal erosions occur this chronic cycle uh, leads to subepithelial fibrosis later scarring and neovascularization develops finally cornea decompensates so what is the minimum endothelial cell count uh, cell density beyond which cornea decompensates can anyone answer this 1000 okay uh, one school of thought says 1000 the critical number is 1000 but cornea really goes bad if it drops before, below 700 okay okay right. when we take a decision on intervention we look for 1000 minimum count of 1000 but if you have a closer look it is not just the number which is important it is also the quality of the cells which are present a little while later in down in the class you will understand the difference between the two for the time being you understand this much go ahead ma it's coming to symptoms when light falls on, on this uh, in fuchs dystrophy gutte will be seen so when light falls they get scattered and there will be glare and blurring of vision especially which is worse in morning and gradually clears off as the day progresses and when the bulle ruptures there will be pain So why is this uh, blurring of vision worse in the morning? Morning blur is the most important question that you should ask a patient when you suspect endothelial dystrophy. So it is important to know why it occurs. Please somebody tell me what is the reason for this? Ma'am, because even the evaporation is not there in the eye. so there is the corneal edema which clears up uh, during the course of the day so when there is poor tear evaporation what happens to the osmolarity so if you say these two terms in your answer you have answered the question completely uh, hyperosmolarity the osmolarity decreases alekia please answer uh, were they right uh, so hyperosmolarity uh, when during night when we sleep there won't be evaporation though the tear film will become hyper hypoosmolar hypoosmolar so the fluid will go into the cornea and edema develops as in the morning time because of evaporation this clears off 
coming to science, gutte are the characteristic feature of Fuchs dystrophy. First, gutte will be seen in the center as the disease progresses. Peripheral cornea is also involved, giving it a characteristic appearance of beaten metal appearance. This image shows gutte, and this is how beaten metal will look like. And this slit lamp image shows gutte in retro beaten metal appearance in slit uh, retro illumination. And there will be stromal edema, microcystic edema, bulle can be there. In advanced cases, subepithelial fibrosis also can be seen. What is the best illumination technique to see gut tail? Can anyone say this? To see the endothelial cells. I'm side or parallelopiped. I'm specular reflection. Yeah, when you correct, no. correct. When you answer, please make sure that you say the correct term. Side angle yeah. is not correct. Specular reflection is the technique of visualizing corneal endothelial cells in light viva okay so if, when you say specular microscopy there is a reflection there is one particular angle which is important to memorize what is the angle aman aman 30 degrees sorry 60 it is 60 degrees 60 so the answer should be 60 degrees and specular microscopy uh, specular reflection okay Go ahead, Alekia. Can anyone grade Gatte? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Somebody, somebody, answer. If no, no takers, let us not waste time. We'll move on. Okay. Go. A Krasner grading scale of uh, is used to grade Gatte. Grade 0 is less than 12 central Gatte, which are non confluent And grade 1 is one, greater than 12 central non confluent Gatte. Grade 2 is 1 to 2 mm of central confluent Gatte. Grade 3 is 2 to 5 mm central confluent gutti. Grade 4 is greater than 5 mm central confluent gutti. And grade 5 is grade 4 with a stromal edema with or without epithelial edema. Then what, what are pseudo gutti? Just a second. So grading is fine. It is from your exam perspective. But from the clinical standpoint, three main things that you should understand. One is discrete central gutti. Please don't worry about the peripheral ones. Those are called hazel handless hazel handless bodies. Correct. So though that is an age-related phenomenon. So don't worry about the peripheral gutte. If you are suspecting a, a Fuchs dystrophy, you have to look in the center. So specular reflection is done in the center of the cornea. You will see discrete gutte. You can count them and grade them as either mild or grade one or two. The next will be confluent. When they become too close to each other, they stick to each other and enlarge. Just like a dendrite becoming an amoeboid, something similar. Here at the endothelial level, discrete ones are coalescing together and forming an amoeboid like a structure. So that you have to look at the area of involvement. Two, two to five, above five is the uh, different gradation. Finally, corneal edema. So whenever you have a corneal edema, the endothelial uh, pump function has clinically been significant but before the edema forms before the edema forms is the stage when the patient will complain of morning blur that is whether the patient has developed morning blur was i audible you got cut in middle ma'am now, now we are audible ma'am your voice is not audible when did it stop Okay, discrete gutte, confluent gutte, and then edema. These are the three main features that we should remember. And uh, one can overlap the other. That is also fine. Before edema, patient will have morning blur. That is why it is important to ask everybody for morning blur. That's what I wanted to elicit. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, can anyone say what are pseudo gutte? No takers. We will just wait for a... 10 seconds. If you don't answer, we will go ahead. Okay, okay go ahead. Pseudogatte are transient endothelial edema associated with anterior segment disease, which do not inv involve dismissed membrane. Like, uh, examples of pseudogatte are like they are seen in case of foreign body, secondary to intraocular in inflammation after trauma, infections, thermal keratoplasty, and sometimes scape is also mimic gutte. Other entities which mimic gutte are endothelial blubs which occur after the placement of contact lens for a long period and endothelial denudation, which is loss of endothelial cells without involving dismissed membrane. Staging of Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. Stage 1 is central non-confluent central gutte which, and patients are typically asymptomatic and stage 2 is central gutte coalesce and there will be loss of hexagonality and the, here painless decrease in vision occurs. 
in stage three, stromal edema with or without bulle occurs. If there is ruptured bulle, pain, pain, pain will be seen and painful attacks are seen. In stage four, cornea, dense, cornea will be densely opaque and vascularized. Here, subarthral fibrosis happens, and this is where the patient experiences painless attacks. Coming to basic investigations, we do pachymetry, specular microscopy, and OCT. Pachymetry measures central corneal thickness. If baseline central corneal thickness of patient is not known, we see the central to peripheral thickness ratio, which is called relative pachymetry. Coming to specular microscopy, the normal parameters we see in specular microscopy are endothelial cell density, hexagonality, the coefficients of variance, cell count, and standard deviation. Can anyone say the characteristic specular features we see in Fuchs dystrophy? You name it. I don't think they are. They we are going to get one in chest. Mom, we get hyporeflective uh, uh, areas without clear borders and um, and polymagnetism can also be seen, ma'am. What is polymagnetism, Meenakshi? The cell uh, size variability, ma'am. So we can have a, a size and shape that uh, pleomorphism is also seen. Yeah, polymagnetism is variability in size. Pleomorphism mm -hmm. is variability in shape. Mm -hmm. So what is the shape? Hexagonal. Okay, why does this happen? Because the remaining uh, cells have to compensate for the cells which are missing. So they slide and sort of try to cover up. As the number of cells decrease, the average size increases or decreases? Uh, Ma'am, as the cells decrease, uh, the average size increases. Yes, so compared to a newborn, an older age person, say 50 plus, will have larger endothelial cells because the cell density is less. Okay, so okay. this is the specular uh, thing I was uh, talking about. It is not just the cell count which is important. It is also the shape of the cell. Sometimes you will have highly uh, variable shape and sizes, but the cell count could be 1000 plus. But if you take a picture and see how the cells are, there will be a significant variability, which is depicted by the standard deviation, SD, it says. Okay. So if you have a high deviation and a high cell count, you have to look into the other parameters to make a judgment as to what is the current status. Go ahead, ma'am. Polymegathism is indicated by coefficients of variance and pleomorphism is given by hexagonality. Greater than 50 to 60 percent of hexagonality is normal and CV is, should be less than 33 is normal. And we do ASOCT. Generally, we see DM thickening, increased corneal thickness, and hyperreflectivity of endothelium. In this OCT, we can see the thickness of, uh, thickening of cornea. And in this OCT, you can see subepithelial fibrosis. Differential diagnosis will be Hazel Henley Watts, which are uh, seen in peripheral cornea, uh, which occurs due to normal aging process, pseudophoetic and aphetic bullous keratopathy, posterior polymorphous dystrophy, Chandler's syndrome, herpetic keratouveitis, macular dystrophy, and rarely in, if it is early onset type of Fuchs dystrophy, you can say con uh, congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy. Come to medical management, we give hypertonic solutions, lubricants, and hair dryers according to some we can use. If bullae are there, antibiotics are given, BCL is placed, and antiostromal micropuncture can be done. Like, when do you give this medical management and what is the role of hypertonic solutions? You go ahead, Alekia. When there is mild edema and the patient is not visually significant, if, when Fuchs disease is not, is not visually significant and other parameters are relatively good, we can go for medical management. And hypertonic solutions, uh, they increase the tonicity of the fluid, thereby causing uh, fluid to move from corneal epithelium into the outside. At, and hypertonic solutions are especially given during night time and if the edema is more in morning times they can we can give them in higher frequency during the morning times as the day progresses we can reduce the dosage coming to surgical management we do penetrating keratoplasty was initially done in this now entire corneal tissue is replaced and now we are doing DSEC and DMEC. In DSEC, posterior stroma and desmet membrane are replaced and in DMEC only desmet membrane is replaced Newer modalities of treatment are DVEC or uh, DSO, which is which means desmet stripping without endothelial keratoplasty or desmet stripping only. It is done in cases of mild central fuchs endothelial dystrophy with confined cavity and undetectable central endothelial count. And this should uh, this requires peripheral corneal endothelium should be healthy. 
there is uh, there should be no clinically evident bullous keratopathy and no ocular comorbidities nowadays rokinus inhibitor used along with uh, dso for increasing the recovery yeah, just a, just a second so the desmet stripping without uh, transplanting uh, donor desmets is the dwig procedure uh, that is done for only stage 1 or 2 where there is not much cause stromal change only localized small area of uh, gecte the idea is to remove the faulty endothelium and let the healthy surrounding endothelium to slide, slide and function and uh, this also has very controversial results some have shown uh, good improvement some have shown not much improvement basically i think it's because of the way in which they had a patient selection when you have when you do it in a edematous cornea obviously the result will not be good or it will take longer time so it is still a not a widespread procedure but possible and rokinus inhibitors like deposital is used this according to studies they, uh, this increases the migration and proliferation of surrounding uh, healthy endothelial cells and coming to the surgery when do you cut this endothelial keratoplasty endothelial keratoplasty is done in visually significant cases of fixed endothelial dystrophy and only keratoplasty is done in in younger patients less than 50 years without any uh, cataract if in cases with fuchs with cataract we can either do a combined surgery or a staged procedure combined surgery is done when uh, in cases of moderate to severe fuchs endothelial dystrophy with corneal thickness of greater than 640 microns and endothelial cell count less than 1000 cells per millimeter square because this cornea tends to decompensate uh, after intra intraocular surgeries and when there is epithelial edema and stromal thickening and in older age in age greater than 50 years because elderly patients will be needing cataract surgery soon and we can do combined surgery instead of two surgeries thereby decreasing the loss of endothelial cells secondary to intraocular surgery and it is also a cost effective procedure and uh, endothelial keratoplasty itself increases the risk of post operative cataracts so we'll go for combined surgery coming to stage procedure this we can uh, do it in two ways either endothelial keratoplasty can be done first and then followed by cataract surgery or cataract surgery first followed by endothelial keratoplasty cataract surgery is done first in cases of who who are having mild fuchs dystrophy with visually significant cataract but in this uh, we have to keep in our mind uh, some factors like alveolar power calculation will be difficult as the k reading won't be accurate in these cases because of bullet and edema and that they can also distort the axial length measurement hyperopic shift should be kept in mind during alveolar calculation so what is hyperopic shift come on somebody answer please what is this mom the there's like there could be a change in the posterior corneal curvature so that could cause a more hyperopic uh, what is the posterior corneal curvature what is the difference now an extra tissue uh, yes, running parallel to the posterior cornea functions as a minus lens minus so it's end up in for plus power oh, it gives okay. plus power the thicker the graph the more is the power So in DSEC mm-hmm. you will have one one point five of hyperopic shift. In DMEC it is point five or less of hyperopic shift. Okay. So this should be taken into account when we are going to combine cataract with uh, DMEC or DSEC. Endothelial keratoplasty is done uh, first and followed by cataract surgery. Then in cases when patients are having visually significant fuchs dystrophy without significant cataract, and in younger patients uh, with age less than fifty years. now with the advent of dmet we are preferring this uh, this stage procedure where endothelial keratoplasty is done first followed by cataract because refractive prediction will be accurate for cataract surgery if edema settles down after keratoplasty for this uh, a smaller graph should be used so that it won't interfere with later cataract incision and graph graph should be placed slightly towards nasal side in case if surgeon is planning a temporal approach for cataract surgery in cases of cataract uh, in fuchs disease we need to follow uh, certain precautions in preop regarding choice of surgery if central corneal thickness is more than 640 microns and endothelial cell count is less than 1000 square meters a square a square mm we have to go for combined surgery to reduce the corneal decompensation chances and risk of corneal decompensation long recovery period should be explained to patient regarding alveolar selection hyd- hydrophilic alveoles should be avoided as they say that they are associated with calcium deposits 
and hyperopic shift should be kept in mind during eye wall calculation. Coming to intraop care, surgical technique, SSS and FACO have. One second, one second, one second, Alex. Apart from this, which type of eye wall should be avoided when you go for a combined procedure? Multifocal eye walls. Premium lenses. Okay. Premium lenses should be avoided. All types of premium lenses. Putting toric is a very tricky situation because um, the corneal dystrophy itself will produce a change in the corneal curvature and a pseudo toricity of the cornea. Okay. If you are able to, we are going to see that in the cases, case presentations following now. So that is very important. If you can I understand that that the cornea is having a pseudotoricity because of the condition which is going to be rectified after your endothelial keratoplasty, please don't bother to put a toric lens. Okay? Always compare it with the other eye. If the other eye is also having normal cornea with the toricity, then you can go ahead with the toric lens. But basically, if you are not sure, you are better not putting the toric lens than putting the lens with the toricity. Multifocal uh, IOLs or not kind of patients. Aspheric lenses, possible. Okay. Yes, coming to choice of surgery, SSCS or FACO have same amount of loss of endothelium, endothelial cells. So it depends on surgeon, uh, surgeon whether, uh, whether to go for SSCS or FACO. Defined blue can be used for visualization of capsule and small capsular excess is preferred to prevent IOL dis dislocation during endothelial keratoplasty in case of combined surgery. Viscoelastics should be used. BSS uh, should be preferred. Use of soft shell technique is preferred. FACO power should be less. And large diameter eye oil is preferred. And myotics are used after eye oil implantation. In FEC, in fuchs dystrophy, incision, incisions may not self seal. So suture should be considered in case of excess uh, instead of excess hydration. Coming to post op, we have to give hypertonic solutions and high frequency steroids. Regular follow up should be maintained. A 61 year old female came with complaints of diminished of vision in left eye since six months. Known case of fuchs dystrophy. On examination, they are gutted. Right eye is status post DMEC with FACO eye well. Toric was placed. This is the pre op pictures. Vision in right eye is 6 6 and 6 with 3 spear, three adapter spear. And vision in left eye is 6 by 7.5 with 10 6 with minus 2 adapter cylinder. Pachymetry was done and in central corneal thickness in left eye is 644 microns. And specular concern to endothelial cell density is 2475 per square mm and 28% hexagonality and CV is 43. Since the patient's vision is good and specular and pachymetry readings are relatively good, we first managed the patient with medical treatment and patient was fine till 4 months. After 4 months, patient vision dropped and it came to 612 N6 with minus 2.525 diopter cylinder. So, patient was advised to undergo combined surgery. And OS DM, DMET, uh, FACO IVOL, TORIC was placed. At last appointment, vision was 66 and 6 with minus 0.75 diopters. Yeah, so when we, the, the question is why TORIC in this particular case? Um, the cornea is relatively good, smooth, regular. But the corneal toricity, which is not, she has not mentioned the K here, that is always high, even before, right from the beginning. So the presence of a corneal toricity has been established. That is why the patient was given toric eye oil. This is a risky thing. Initially, you don't do. Only when you gain experience, you can start doing all this. Go to the next one. But the outcome has been good. A 62-year-old female came with complaint of diminution of vision in right eye since one year. On examination, both eye gutte are seen, right greater than left, and she is on dual AGMs. At presentation, vision was 6 by 24 and 12 with a minus 1.50 sphere with plus 3 adapter add. One month later, she presented with a drop in vision, six, uh, it dropped to 636 N18, and edema and gutte also increased. Specular counts are endothelial cell density is 1873 per square mm and for hexagonality is 45%. CV is 48. Central corneal thickness is 714 microns. OCT is showed, is done, it showed. Just stop, stop a second. Huh? Just see this, guys. Corneal edema is significant, but cell count is pretty good. It's 1000 plus. Okay? But the um, percentage of hexagonal cells is low, 45. And coefficient of variance is moderate. But 
this uh, OCT shows significant subepithelial fibrosis. When the subepithelial fibrosis sets in, the chances of quick vision recovery is impeded. So it will take longer time for the edema will clear first, but the fibrosis will take longer time to clear. The longer the duration of fibrosis present, the slower it will recover. Sometimes the residual fibrosis can permanently reduce vision. So that is why it, once the uh, subepithelial fibrosis sets in, the surgery has to be done as soon as possible. Okay. So though the cell count is good, other parameters are not in favor of uh, waiting. So it is not just the cell count. It is a total patient in, taken into account. Go ahead. Pentagram was done and it showed significant astigmatism of seven diopters. Yeah, this is what I wanted to bring your notice to. In the previous case, there was cornea reasonable. The cornea showed uh, astigmatism. I wish she had put the pentagram of the previous patient, which she has missed. But in this particular case, the pentagram is showing a high cylinder. If you see, there is an inferior steepening in the uh, surface maps. Uh, can you show Alekia the packing uh, surface map? Yeah, you can see inferior steepening. Okay, the next one, the bottom one, you go, bottom one, the bottom one, the purple, purple color around the blue. This one. No, just below, yeah. So that is the area of thickening. Okay, that is very thick zones. Now you go to the top one, the next one, yeah. No, no, the next one, yeah. Here, if you see the elevation, yeah. Is that the elevation? I'm not able to see properly. What does that show? Elevation. Elevation. And below that? Back elevation, ma'am. This is. This is back elevation. Back elevation is in the purple zone is in the zone of what are the figures there? 80, 91, 65, 69. Plus or minus? Minus, ma'am. Minus, ma'am. Huh? Ma yeah. So yeah. that is what you should look into account. The area where the anterior cornea is elevated, which is shown in the red zone. The corresponding zone in the posterior cornea is in purple, which is depression. So that means the cornea has swollen and that swelling is reflected in the pachyma. So all of those areas correspond to each other and exactly in the same spot, the cornea is also steep. So this is a steepness produced only by the corneal edema. So in these cases, dare not do anything to correct the toricity. Is that clear? Yes, me. Okay, go ahead. OD DMAC FACO IOL thickness was done on post-operative day 3. While haze was seen, maybe due because of subepithelial fibrosis, central corneal thickness was 5, 514 microns and OCT showed small DMD in, in multiple areas. At GA, vision was 612 N6 with minus 1.50 cylinder. There is no uh, picture available in this widget. Central corneal thickness was 578 microns and pachymetry showed 2110 square cells per square mm with hexagonality 41% and CV is 55. After three months, vision dropped to 615 N6 and endothelial resection is noted. We treated them with uh, topical steroids and a dose of IVMP is given. It got cleared and vision got back to 6.9 and 6 after 4 months uh, with a cylinder of minus 1.50 diopters. After 6 months again, uh, again vision dropped to 6.12 and 6 and again uh, endothelial resection is noted. We again treated him with steroids, topical and IVMP and it got cleared. Vision in, at this visit is 6.9 and 6 with minus 1.50 diopter cylinder. Total after one end of year, vision was 6.9 and 6 with one, minus 1.50 cylinder and central corneal thickness is 491 microns. And spectrometry values are uh, endothelial cell density 1306 cells per square mm with 31% hexagonality and CV is 57. Yeah, so basically uh, we were better off by not putting the toric lens in this case. And the final uh, cylinder which is uh, remaining is 1.5, which is much better than if we had corrected it. And uh, very important in this patient is she has had two episodes of acute rejection within the initial year, but she has dramatically improved. So that is the most important take home message to every patient that we operate. It is of paramount importance to tell them to rev run back to the hospital as soon as possible within three days of the onset then you can have this dramatic improvement. If they miss the bus, we can still treat. They will go in for failure. We will see such patients in the next couple of cases. Go ahead. Two-year-old female 
who was diagnosed as a right eye HSV keratitis and was treated with steroids elsewhere, now came for uh, opinion on secondary glaucoma. On examination, OU gatte has seen, so diagnosed as Fuchs dystrophy. And this slit lamp image of right eye showing scarring and edmile edema. Vision was 618N6 with one diapter sphere with plus three diapters add. And specular counts were not recordable. Pachymetry showed central corneal thickness of 658 microns. Pentacam was done and no significant astigmatism was noted. This is a picture of OCT showing uh, subepithelial fibrosis. And body DMET with uh, FACO IOL was planned. On post operative day, day 3, vision was 3 by 60 and N36, which was improving to 6 by 60 with pinhole. Central corneal thickness is 673 microns. And OCT showed min minor DMD for uh, peripheral area. At glass appointment, vision was counting fingers at 50 and N, N less than N36 with plano, counting finger at 50, showing um, stromal edema with bullet. Central corneal thickness is 828 microns. And OCT showed a bull, epithelial bullet and large desmet membrane detachment. Can anyone say how do you manage a desmet membrane detachment? What is burping? An air injection again so that the decimates membrane, it uh, if it is not uh, torn, if it is intact, then it uh, like gets adhered or by sort of a tamponade to the cornea, posterior surface. So your answer should be air injection for the purpose of desmetopexy. Burping is just a let out of extra... Uh, air so that the pressure is titrated. So burping is not a treatment. It is a post air injection management. Am I clear? Yeah, I'm sorry. So you have your answer is now tell me the answer. What do you do for a uh, DMD in a DMEC graft? Air injection desmetopexy. The air injection for desmetopexy. Good. Go ahead, ma. Air injection was done on post op day one. This was clinically attached. And central corneal thickness was 612 microns and OCT so showed a minimal DMD. After one week, everything got cleared, DMD settled and central corneal thickness was 5, 560 microns and the uh, OCT showed a fully attached graft. Nine months later, vision was 6696 with, with minus 0.75 diopter cylinder and central corneal thickness is 529 microns. Endothelial cell count is one six uh, cell density is one thousand six hundred and fourteen per square mm. Hexagonality is forty percent and CV is thirty seven. Yeah, one point uh, two things I want to bring for your attention here. If you look at the pre-op picture, there is significant scarring, which is uh, proven in the ASOCT as a subepithelial fibrosis. But by the final uh, follow-up, the patient is uh, almost the scarring is gone. So earlier the school of thought was when you have a subepithelial fibrosis you don't go for an endothelial keratoplasty you go for a penetrating keratoplasty but now it's proven endothelial keratoplasty is still doing fine in these cases of subepithelial fibrosis so in your exam and the examiner asks you can have both the schools of thought so based on the examiner's experience and exposure they would vary in their answers so you'll have to judge that and give your answer you can say earlier that was the thought so now endothelial keratoplasty has been proven. So then they will understand you that you have understood the subject. That is point number one. The second one is um, the DMD. So whenever we perform an endothelial keratoplasty, it is very important to keep the patient around for two visits. And when you let them go for a month for a GA, the most important advice to give the patient is to check, to keep checking their vision at home. Whenever they feel any sudden drop, they have to report immediately. That is the only way you are going to pick up all these DMDs while the patient is not in your monitoring. The moment they come within two, three days, if you if they report and you do, the outcome is dramatic. So this is very important to note as an endothelial surgeon. Go ahead. A 51-year-old male came with complaint of diminution of vision in both eyes since five years. On examination, gatte are seen in both eyes, right, right, then left. This is right eye picture. Vision is 618 and 6 with NS1 cataract uh, with minus 2 diopter cylinder. And central corneal thickness is 571 microns. Specular count is not recordable. Left eye, vision is 624 and 6 with minus 2.50 diopter cylinder. 
central corneal thickness is seven, 610 microns and specular counts are endothelial cell density is 2458 cells per square mm exogonality is 30 30 percent cv is 51 and patient was advised both eye combined surgery but patient was anxious about corneal intervention and wanted only cataract surgery alone in left eye as specular counts were good in left eye they were proceeded with left eye cataract surgery and post-op risk of corneal edema and need for DMEC uh, later is explained to the patient, but patient wanted uh, cataract surgery alone. This is a pre-op picture, uh, picture of left eye with vision 624 with minus 2.50 diopters. Specular counts, was, uh, fake eye oil was done. And post-op did with day 3, vision was 624 N18, which improved to 69 with pinhole, uh, but there was corneal edema. At GA, uh, vision was 69 with N6, with minus two, two diopter cylinder, but corneal edema persisted. Though vision was good in both visits, patient was symptomatic from post-operative to day one and he was on continuous treatment. So patient was advised combined surgery, sorry, patient was advised to undergo endothelial keratoplasty. And this is the uh, donor uh, cornea, specular count of donor cornea. Uh, donor age is 65, 66 years, he is fakey. So uh, endothelial cell density is 2,702 cells per square mm. So, hexagonality is 55 percent, CV is 32. On post-operative day 1, vision is 66 with N6. On post-operative day 5, there is an, I know, um, here F sign is C. I don't know whether it is visible for now. CCT, uh, central corner thickness is 522. F sign is visible for you guys? Yes, ma'am. Okay, what is the role of F sign? Why do you have to... Stamp the side of the uh, uh, layer when it is placed at the when the scroll is injected and okay and erect, erect F sign means the orientation of the DMA graft is proper am I right and where do you make the sign which which side which uh, side of the DMA graft do you make stromal side stromal side so it has to be on the stromal side. An erect sign indicates that your orientation of the graft is correct. That's how you answer the question. Go ahead. Central corneal thickness is 523 microns and OCT sh showed small focal desmoid membrane detachment. Since centrally it is attached, we need not intervene at this case. This is a histopathological section showing gut day and loss of endothelial cells. At gla glass appointment, vision was 66 and 6 with minus 1 diopter cylinder. Central corneal thickness is 491 microns and specular counts are 1,429 square mm per square mm. Hexogonality is 38 percent. CV is 48. After two six, uh, sorry, after two years, vision is 66 and 6 with minus 1 diopter cylinder. Central corneal thickness is 487 microns. Specular counts are 1,434 cells per square mm. 39 percent hexagonality. CV is 35. Totally from pre-op to post-op, there is a loss of 41 percent of endothelial cells. OCT showed fully attached graft. Just a second here. Um, somewhere during the uh, post-op, once you are seeing 1429 as the endothelial cell density, further down you are seeing 1434. Is it possible? Can somebody tell me why this is happening? Over a period of time, there should be a depression, not increase. Can somebody tell me why we are seeing uh, such values? Uh, Ma'am, every time we can't measure it at the same location, so... That's, that's the answer, correct. So each time we don't measure in the same location, so there is a chance of inter-test variability allowed. Okay? So that is the reason why we have to take multiple times and then uh, take the average. Uh, as you know, there is a high uh, coefficient of variance here and uh, the cells are of variable size and uh, distribution. So you suppose you take the count in a very uh, small area where the cells are very tiny, your cell count is going to obviously increase. Okay, so this is possible. Go ahead. After two years with the experience of past, past experience, he, uh, he accepted for combined surgery in right eye. So this is the right eye pre uh, with vision of 618 and 6 with minus 2.50 diopters. And central corner thickness is 547 microns. Specular readings were unrecordable. And OCT, DMAC fake oil was done. And post operative day 3, mild edema with bullet is seen. Vacuumetry showed 711 microns, central corner thickness. 
and OCT showed a minimal uh, DMT at last appointment, which was 618 and 6 with minus 3 diactors sitting there. Next case, a 59-year-old female came with complaints of clear and pain, which were worse in the morning since four years. She is on uh, AGMs. On examination, both eye content gatte are seen with corneal edema, so diagnosed as fuchs dystrophy. Both eye vision is 612 and 6. And central corneal thickness in right eye is 613 microns and left eye is 627 microns. Specular counts were not recordable in both eyes. And so both eye we advised combined, combined surgery. The patient wanted right eye surgery first. So this is a pre-op picture of right eye with vision 612 and 6. And post-operative day 5, we have seen a mild edema is being seen. And this is the OCT picture showing epithelial bullae and, my, uh, and small multiple DMDs. Central corneal thickness was 1020 microns. At GA, at GA, focal separation is noted and vision was 69 and 6 with minus 1.50 diopters. Central corneal thickness is 582 microns and OCT was done and it showed focal DMD. Since it, central cornea is clear, we, do, we won't interfere in this case. Yeah, just a second. Here you have uh, detachment only in the periphery and uh, rest of the zones it is um, attached. Okay, in this you you can approach this patient in two ways. One is observe, where you have to see whether it is progressively increasing or not. If it is a superior one, the chances of progressively increasing due to gravity is a possibility. If it is elsewhere, there is a chance that it can fibrose and settle down. Okay, so in this case, we have decided to settle it down, uh, not intervene. Go ahead. After one end of year, it got settled and vision was 6, 6 and 6 with minus 1.50 diopter cylinder. Central corneal thickness is 550 microns. Specular counts are endothelial cell density is 2309 cells per square mm. is 35% and CV is 46. And OCT showed fully attached uh, graph. Come to next case. Once again, in fact, that area has scarred down and gotten a little stumped. Okay. It is not fluffy, fluffy and detached like how it was. It is more slightly detached and taut. It becomes a little uh, like a stump. That's fine. But it's in the periphery. It's non-progressive. So you cannot, you don't have to bother. Go ahead. A 52-year-old male came with complaints of diminution of vision in left eye since five months. He's a known case of Fuchs dystrophy. It's a pre-op picture of right eye with vision 69N6 with minus 1.50 diopter cylinder with NS2 cataract. And is a picture of left eye. Vision was counting fingers in, at one meter. Central corneal thickness is uh, in right eye it is 628 microns. In left eye 767 microns. Specular counts are not recordable. And patient was advised combined surgery. Patient first underwent OS B set with the uh, FACO IOL. Pentagon was done. Astigmatism was a uh, significant astigmatism of five diopters is noted. This is the corner um, donor cornea we used. Donor is of 69 years age, pseudo uh, Endothelial cell density is 2659 cells per square mm. Hexagonality is 38% and CV is 48. On post op day to day 4, corneal edema is noted. Pentacam was done. A plus 3 diopter astigmatism is noted. Central corneal thickness is 934 microns. OCT showed superior and inferior DMD. Patient did not turn up for uh, GA. Patient came after four months. Vision was counting finger one meter. On examination, failed visa graft is noted. PAM was done and it came as 6 by 48. Since there is a chance for improvement, repeat surgery was planned. After 10 months, patient came to hospital for surgery after, 10, after six months, that is post of 10 months. Every OCT was done and epithelial bullae are noted. Central corneal thickness is 736 microns and vision is counting fingers close to face. So we, we have done OS DMEC in this case. Just a second, I just want to bring uh, to the notice that um, when you decide a re-surgery in these cases, ASOCT is very important because it is going to tell you what is the status of the stroma. 10 months post-surgery with uh, failure, sometimes the patient could end up in stromal scarring. In those situations, it is not a good idea to repeat the endothelial keratoplasty because it's already going to be the second procedure. So it, it better be the last. Okay. So in that perspective, we will go for a penetrating keratoplasty. But since this patient had not so bad uh, corneal uh, stromal uh, scarring, 
it's more of an edema with uh, increased thickness and uh, surface changes uh, we decided to do edema but uh, it is always important to tell the patient that complete vision recovery will take longer period of time sub optimal visual outcome is a possibility so that is the um, trade off the patient has to understand uh, by when deciding whether to go for a dmec or a pk there are some patients who don't want to go for anything sub optimal immediately they will understand the risk of pk and uh, what is uh, its a conventional treatment and it has got more uh, um, complications and other things they will understand but this has to be elaborately discussed with the patient and then only a decision has to be taken go ahead oh yes dm question this is specular image of the donor cornea donor was 73 years old fake it and uh, cell density is 2079 per mm square so hexagonality is 47% and cv is 39 on post operative day 5 vision was 2 by 60 less than n36 and on post uh, the oct showed clearly attached graft so this patient is waiting for further final okay. treatments okay fine okay so so far it, it's it's showing good signs so let's hope for the best okay go ahead this are my references okay good class any questions any doubts in the exam all of you will answer the question related to fuchs okay good. all the best write your exams well if no questions we'll close it good class sabhya this is the first one and no first one third one third one good good effort you have collected so many files and uh, so many uh, photographs you did back and forth listen to me and you did it well so all the best keep the good work thank you so much yeah bye yeah good presentation ali thank you ma'am thank you